Okay. okay. I'll stay on just in case. Yeah, thanks. Can you go through it? Yeah, I, I will. I will be going through it. Let's go through it now. Okay. Let's solve this one first, or maybe you want to have a chance at that. So let, let me solve this one. So the first thing we have to do is uh, go through the tokens, of course. And uh, so we can go and do for uh, I don't know if this will work, but we will just try something. What should the next line be? Anyone? So what we want is we want string to decompose. And we want um, i colon i plus two. That's the string we want. But we only want it when i mod two is equal to zero. Oh, nice. Hey, Elo, you're on. You're not on mute. Just FYI. Okay. Paralyze. Uh, okay. So um, we go with uh, we write a list. Change that to characters. We just do list of two characters dot depend. Uh, there's room six in the fourth on the fourth floor. Oh, yeah. Let me hey Eloy. I need to mute him. Okay, I muted him. Okay. A list of two characters. And then we can just go with print. List of two characters. Uh, do we see any issues with this code? Do we understand what's going on? Any questions? What's up? This is the more complicated way. Okay, uh, you found an easier way. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you want it to work in a way where it works for any string, not just for uh, this specific string, right? That's the whole point of writing functions. It's that for any string, you want it to work. And so what's going on here, maybe we can walk through it, is given the string, which is QC bio workshop, you're going through it character by character, and every character has an index, zero, one, two, three, four, like we discussed before. When the index is an even number, so zero, two, so this would be zero, two, four, and so on, what you would do is you would add to a list just that string from the ith to the i plus two. So between these regions, right? So QC would be captured from i to i plus two. And then you go on and you, and you go to C and you say, well, hold on. C is at index one. One mod two is not zero, so we don't do anything. Then we go to B, right? And we say, okay, B index is two. 2 mod 2 is 0 now, and so we append 2 colon 4, which is basically b i. Does the, does the code make sense? Is it just to get, I know it's hard, okay? Yeah. What if you did it in the way to say, yeah. what I did you yeah, that's actually really nice. Yeah. I mean yeah. that that you're you're very close. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. 
So will this run? I, I don't know. It does run. Okay. Well, well, does mine run? Yes, it does. Okay. I will be sharing with you the completed, um, the completed uh, code also after the workshop. So there's nothing to worry about. Okay, now uh, you're given some time to complete uh, this um, part. This part is a, basically a copy of the previous part, but it's a little simpler. So why don't we go ahead and try that one? Just the one below it. But it has to work for any input. It has to work for any input, that's correct. So try to find the pattern like large language models do about what it is, what it is that given this string, I want to extract these strings. What, what is the key underlying principle? Um, well, it's actually not that complicated. Um, it's just checking if there's a space, right? Yeah. Oh, really? so yeah. this word now has spaces. Oh, previous one, previous one didn't. Right. So, so you might be asking yourself why we're doing these exercises, and that's a good point. Um, the reason we're doing this is because large language models fundamentally rely on these kinds of functions. They take an yeah. input text segment, like a sentence, like ships and coffee, and they break it up into these smaller chunks. We call these chunks tokens. These are examples of tokens. They are pieces of the text. And so like every time you run something through chat GPT, your text goes through this thing called a tokenizer. It takes your text and it breaks it up into these tokens. We'll get, we'll come back to it in great detail very soon. So don't worry. There are existing libraries that do it for us, but I think it's valuable just to get started to uh, get some Python going. Yeah, are you, are, are you done? Okay. So there are some nice ways of writing this, of course. If you know Python, it's easier. Yeah. What's up? Oh, let's remove that. Pass is just there to indicate that that's where you need to write. So um, you can delete that. Okay. We need to decompose. So there's a shortcut here that you can use. It's just called split. And you can just use the space. Okay. It's... What's that? Oh, is space? Oh, then let's try to use it. Why not? Okay. So there's something called is space. Fine. So that works. Let's try something else. So for i in char in character in string dot to decompose. Um, and so we have to use enumerate here as usual. Right now we can check that if ch uh, if is space how does that go is it ch dot is space okay so what do you want to do here so we can say list of words is a list and then any 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 ideas if if you get a space what are you supposed to do. Yeah. So, so how do we do that? We need a J. But then we go with list of words dot append. And then we go string to decompose. Okay. Then what do we do? J colon I. Then what do we do? Are we done? 
Exactly. So how do we do that? So we are missing one step here. So we need to set um, j equals i plus 1. Right. So let's walk through it. There's still a bug, but let's see if you can tell me where that is. So um, for every character we're going through, and we hit a we hit a space, right? So we hit a space, QC space. Right? So we have a space now, and so I is pointing to the space. J is still pointing to zero. Nothing yet has happened. So we go from zero to the space and we capture QC. Okay? Is that fair? And then the, the key here is that J equals I plus one is necessary because you don't want J to point to the space. You want to point it to the next character after the space, to, to, to the B, right? Does that make sense? So that's how you do this. Okay. One, two, three, no. Um, it, it so uh, it does not work because as uh, your peer was saying, basically what that would do is add into a list QC, QC bio, QC bio work. There's nothing to restart the J index to the next word. Okay, so I need to J, J to I. Yeah, basically. J That's right. So, what is the bug here? Is there a mistake? Um. I is automatically incremented when you're going to the for loop. So any issues you see with this? So you want to see what happens if we print it? Will I get the last word? We'll take a break after this, no issues. Okay, so we didn't get the last word. Why didn't we get the last word? There's no space after that. Exactly, right? So there's no space at the end of shop. So as far as you're concerned, you're done. You didn't reach a space at the end. You calmly went till the end and you realized that, okay, um, Jay is still teetering along somewhere behind, but you reached the end of the word and you haven't yet taken that last chunk. See, if I added the space to the input, it would, it would have got it perfectly. Okay. But the fact is that because I don't have the space, by the time it comes to shop, there's no space there. So you're, you never get into this point to add that last piece. This J is currently pointing to S, the shop, S. And there's no, there's nothing here that tells that tells the function to actually finish it up and actually get that last piece, uh, you know, um, into your list. Add a space to this monster. Yeah, let's just do that. That that that's one way, but we can't expect that at the input. So, uh, uh, what if you don't have the space? Yeah. So if you don't have the space, it won't get the last word. Let me tell you that maybe we can leave this as an exercise for the uh, class, um, you know, in your own time. But there is a way to do it but without it. We need to add it out. We can do that exactly. So you can think along those lines. I won't give you the answer quite yet, <laughs> but you 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 can work on it in your own time. Okay. Okay. So it's um it's two forty five. We've been here an hour, so let's take a five minute break and resume.
Yeah, so I'm going to pause the recording now. Okay, great. So uh, we finished just going through some basic data, Python data structures. And um, one thing that I think will be absolutely paramount for the next steps is to go through Python libraries. So these are the libraries that I think are fundamental to ML uh, mostly, but uh, if you can do these, then you can do most libraries in Python. Um, so these are NumPy or NumPy, uh, Pandas and sklearn. Uh, NumPy is used for a fast uh, matrix multiplication, multiplication and other um, math. And the reason it's fast is because it has some optimizations written in C++ or C. Um, Pandas is used for loading and unloading CSV files mostly, but it can upload and download math files too, like uh, from, Mat from MATLAB that you might be familiar with, or I think that's through NumPy, but anyway. Um, and uh, you can do a bunch of data pre-processing using Pandas. Um, sklearn is used for machine learning. And uh, before we get into that, we will have a primer on machine learning, so there's not much to worry about here. Okay, so uh, in terms of, and there will be intermediate coding challenges in between, so please continue paying attention, thank you. So um, NumPy, um, how does that work? Well, uh, similar to lists, but it can do more mathy stuff. So, well, that was really a bad introduction for NumPy, but um, for example, uh, okay, let me just quickly run this cell here. Okay. So this array now is a three by three matrix containing the numbers one through nine arranged row wise. Okay. I can find splices just like I was doing in lists, but now I, I do it across both the dimensions and I can find sub matrices. Anybody is who doesn't know about matrices? Fresh to matrices? No, everyone knows matrices? Okay. Uh, you can flatten a matrix. So this takes the matrix and it just squishes it row by row into uh, a single a dimensional or like a, a single uh, dimension vector. Right? You can transpose, this dot T means transpose a matrix. So you take this and transpose. Transpose means that your rows becomes columns, columns becomes rows. And so instead of having one, two, three as a row, you'd have one, two, three as a column. One, four, seven as a column would become one, four, seven as a row. So it just flips along the major diagonal. Okay. And uh, if you take, if you transpose and flatten it, any idea what you might get before I run it? Seven. Yeah. Two, four. Okay, what do you think? Anyways, there's something here. It's a yeah. yeah, so it's just along the columns. I think you both got it. Well, I think you got it, but <laughs> um, yeah, so it's basically along the columns one, four, seven, two, five, eight, three, six, nine. Um, you can construct random matrices where the elements in this matrix are between zero and one. And uh, you can specify the dimensions of that matrix in size. So this, can, this is corresponding to the number of rows. This corresponds to the number of columns, 768 divided uh, by 10,000, which is a pretty big matrix. Um, but you can do that. You can try printing it. And you get a pretty, yeah. It's it's a very valid point. I think they did a bad job with naming this uh, library random part. So uh, it's very confusing. Honestly, when I wrote this, I had to Google it myself. So uh, I've been using it for many years now and it's always confusing. So it's it's np.random.random, okay. The, the reason is because 
Well, well, the reason is because in random, the first random, there are several um, functions like choice, distributions. Um, so it need not always be random, which in this case refers to a uniform distribution. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you can always print these out. And you can look at the shape of these matrices by saying dot shape. You can get the first row of that vector using vectors of zero. You can get the second row, vectors of one. Yeah. You can get a first column, but I won't print the entire column because it's too long. So this corresponds to the first column and this corresponds to the first hundred elements of the first column. And I know this is a little tricky, but this is the first column because I'm specifying zero here in the second spot rather than the first. Yes. Okay. So yes, that's right. So this is the first column of the vectors matrix. And colon 100 refers to the first 100 elements of that column vector. Okay, so you can you can splice and dice these matrices in any way. It's a lot of fun. Um, so um, this one is uh, basically, you can create another random matrix of 768 by 768. And then this at symbol you see refers to matrix multiplication. So you can take... This is basically, what is this doing? This is doing a 768 cross 768 multiplied by 768 cross 10,000. So That's right. So if you do this, it does it really fast. And it, uh, yeah, so it computes that for you in an instant. Okay. 10,000 came from vectors. Vectors was initialized as a random matrix of 768 by 10,000. Now, question for you. Will this work? Uh, yeah, this is matrix multiplication. Will this work? Why not? Yeah, the the inner dimensions would not match, and so this will result in an error. Right. And it'll clearly tell you what the error is, so it's pretty straightforward to find out. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so uh, let me fix that because I don't like to see errors. Um, yeah, I will send you the final code. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, now Torch is another library that um, is basically doing what NumPy does, but it has other utilities like computing these things called gradients and um, also specifies or helps you specify where a vector is stored in the computer. Now, in the computer, uh, you have different spaces where you can store a vector. You can store it on CPU, which is where all the, the central processing unit, right? Or you can store it in, a, in an external device that you plug in that's meant for doing these fast computations. That's called a GPU, basically a graphics processing unit. So what Torch will help you do is figure out which device you're going to use to run your matrix multiplications, whether that is on the CPU, which is your computer hardware, or the GPU, which is typically like a, an external, much faster, much more efficient hardware. So using Torch is very standard for deep learning models or large scale language models, because since these are big, you want to use the most effective and efficient form of memory 
to do these computations. So you tend to use Torch rather than NumPy. Torch and NumPy have very similar um, functions and uh, like it flows pretty easily if you know NumPy. Um, there's not much to learn additionally uh, from NumPy, but uh, at least for this workshop, these are the two most important things that um, Torch can help you tell you which um, device a vector is in so that maybe you can do your computations faster. And number two is that it computes these things called gradients, which we're going to completely skip for this uh, workshop because we're dealing with inferencing and not training. For training LLMs, maybe we need to have another workshop. Okay. Okay, cool. So let's see how Torch works. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, ignore that. I won't be getting into that for now. But CUDA basically specifies the device. So CUDA means GPU. GPU is like the uh, the 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 device where these matrix multiplications happen much more efficiently. So by saying to CUDA, you're taking a vector that's say like a NumPy vector, and you're moving it into the GPU. Okay, and then you say. Um, to CPU, you take that vector in the GPU and you move it back into the CPU. So that's like one of the few added functionalities in Torch that you need to care about compared to NumPy. Maybe we can run a few experiments to see how they respond. So once again, uh, you know, these work just like um, NumPy. So you see tensor from one to five. Now, equivalently, I could have gone and done uh, you know, uh, import numpy as np a equals, or let me just say torch equals np dot array. Uh, the same exact thing, right? I could have done one, two, three, four, five. And then if I printed torched, I would have got the numpy equivalent. So torch and numpy have very similar usage. Um, but uh, what Torch does give you is this added benefit of doing things on the GPU, which makes things substantially faster. Okay. So um, yeah, so we, we can move um, these um, arrays to and from the GPU. So if you say dot to CUDA, it moves it. Oh, whoops, that's because I have to run this again. Uh, okay. So if I say dot to CUDA, so you can see now that it has assigned this torch um, uh, array to a device where it resides. So it tells you that in addition to, to storing this uh, array, there's also this additional parameter device that tells you, okay, this array is stored in this particular device. And that device is CUDA zero, which is basically a very common uh, alias for saying the first GPU in your machine. So uh, when you have multiple GPUs, they, these identifiers usually go CUDA 0, CUDA 1, CUDA 2. Why do you see CUDA everywhere? Does anyone know? Bit of trivia? So any trivia on the... No. It's fairly accurate, right? So it's basically, um, I, I would say it's more like a firmware. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it helps integrate what you write in Python to the efficiencies presented hardware. And CUDA is kind of the intermediate um, language, architecture, firmware, whatever it is actually. But essentially this term CUDA refers to that. And we, we, we alias these GPUs as CUDA zero, CUDA one, CUDA two. And uh, yeah, so you can move things onto CUDA. And similarly, you can also move things onto CPU. And so when you move it back onto CPU, you, you don't see the device anymore because it's not part of any device. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, uh, like if you did push that to Buddha multiple times, would you go to Buddha uh, <laughs> you put stuff on CUDA one? So in this case, uh, because you're running things on a Google Colab, uh, and it's probably the free version, which most of you are on, you get a single GPU, a T4 single GPU. 
And so you won't see more than one CUDA, which is CUDA zero. But for example, if you have servers in your research lab that have GPUs, oftentimes you will see five or six server uh, GPUs, each with a CUDA number associated with it. Okay. So zero, one, two, three, four. Well, you, where do you put stuff on this stupid CUDA? Yeah, so you can do that. You can meet, you can specify here that you want to put it into CUDA one. And I, if I'm right, it should crash because it'll tell you that this device does not exist. Okay, yeah. because it's just not plugged in. Only yeah. zero is plugged in. So if you're if you don't know which CUDA is available, just say CUDA, it'll figure out for itself. Yeah. Right? So does it actually move the data into the uh, video card memory or is it just uh... it moves the data, but it does something very fancy with the pointers associated to that data because if you think about it, and that's quite surprising to me, the, the movement between the CPU and the GPU are very fast. So uh, I don't know quite how they do it, um, but it is very convenient from a user's perspective because you can use the same variable name, torched, to access the memory wherever it is located. So uh, that's the cool part for me. Um, so moving it to um, CUDA will speed up the next time you run anything, is that why they do it? It speeds up matrix multiplications. So if you multiply two vectors on a GPU versus two vectors on a CPU, um, under certain load configurations, most often than not, the GPU does far more efficiently. Okay. There are exceptions to that, but uh, for now we can consider this to be the, 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 the true. Uh, the truth, yeah. Okay, so let me fix that. Great. So um, again, we can also use many of the same functionalities carry over. So um, let me ask you a question. Um, in this example, I have initialized a second vector. And in this case, I, I printed shape and it gave me one file. Previously, I had a similar little thing where, um, let me see, let me do the same thing here. Uh, let me go this and let me then do this. Yeah, so here I did, I did something that looked very similar. Torch equals torch dot tensor, one, two, three, four, five, torch dot shape five. Now, if I go down, um, here, I did a very similar thing, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I did shape, but now I got a one comma five. Uh, what's the difference? Okay, and so what does that imply? So that means it's a torch of a torch. Right, so it's basically a 2D array. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when you specify the second pair, this is saying that the first, that the interior list is the first row of a 2D matrix. Yeah. And so when you have to give people the shape of that, you say one five. But on the other hand, if you just had a single um, pair of square brackets, this is just a single dimensional kind of vector. And so it just has five elements. And so you just say five. The distinction between five and one five is extremely crucial and leads to most of the mistakes I make personally in using Torch. Um, if you forget that one, that one dimension, it can really mess you up. So please be very careful when you use that. Um, yeah. So the same uh, vector you can put one, two, three, three. Yeah, let's try that. So let's go with uh, four, like that, and let's see what happens. Yeah. So this is a, a four, 4D matrix, where for the first three dimensions are one, and it has five elements. So uh, yeah, you can extend it to any amount. Wait, but if you add it, like, in... The most inner set of yeah. Uh, the second most inner set of brackets you added another five set would be one 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 
important to exactly you nailed it but then what if you add stuff to like the third step one two one two yes okay. that's exactly how this works yeah and uh yeah, and so you might be asking yourself, where do we even have to use things like this? And they, we do. Um, uh, you might have... Exactly. Right. So if you use convolutional neural networks for face, re face recognition, object tracking, these kinds of things, you will see this thing called a convolutional kernel that actually does use 40 tensors that look like that. So they're an absolute pain to work with. But yeah. Okay. So um, hope you've uh, followed through and uh, we have a small little, this is not, this won't take you too long. One of these works, the other doesn't. So uh, in your, the code base I shared with you, kindly run up to the cell and we can take us, I'll walk around and we'll take like a two minutes and you can maybe try to figure out which of these three statements actually works and help me understand why. I will pause the recording for uh, a minute. The recording. So um, let's see why this does not work and let's see the error message that it gives us. Okay. So it clearly tells you that uh, we expected all the tensors to be on the same device, but we found at least two devices, two different devices. And it even gives you an exclamation mark. Um, and so, you have to make sure that both your matrices are on the same device before you do any operations. Okay, so dot. So if you do that, would that work? Probably. Oh, still no, because the dimensions are mismatched. So which one did work? Let's go to that one. The first one worked. Oh, reshaped is not defined. I guess I changed mine a little bit to run this, give me a minute. Okay, great, so we got that. If we move this to CUDA, will this work? Now, if we move both of them to CUDA, will it work? Yeah, we hope so. No, uh, reshaped IADMM CUDA. Okay, this is some edge case that I have no idea about. Uh, dot CUDA at ADMM, ADDMM CUDA not implemented for long. Um, let me get back to this one. There's something really weird happening here, okay, that uh, I should figure out. But, um, okay, moving on. Yeah. Can you explain why it's returning uh, 130? Yeah. So let's go back to the original. Okay, so let's look at the shapes. Let's print the two. Okay, so this is how it looks. And it's basically a one cross five times five cross one, which is, we expect a one cross one. So that's one times six, six plus two times seven, 14. That's 20 plus eight times three, 24. That's 44 uh, plus uh, 36. So you keep doing that 80 plus 50, so that's 130. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting into territory that you're not supposed to. Uh, basically, this is very this is this is probably the most tricky part in Torch, reshaping multi-dimensional matrices. So maybe I can sit with you and like discuss the nuances, but even I get confused when I have to reshape multi-dimensional matrices. So every time I go, I have to go back and read the documentation on how to reshape. It's very confusing. Okay. We're not going to get to that part. Uh, you think you can? It did. Yeah, so if it did, yeah, so why is that working? Yeah, so if they're both, um, if they're both five, it's doing five times five and it's giving you a right answer. 
see what's going to what's what the problem is here is that if you reshape this as a one cross five, which is what it actually is, reshape this as a one cross five. Will this still work? If you're going to be deterministic about the yeah. Okay, but if it's a single dimension, it works. If one of them is a multi-dimension, does that work? No. It tries to typecast the five into a one cross five and then shows you that it cannot be multiplied. So these are all tricky edge cases. And when you're getting started with Torch, you will run into these. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's no other way. Okay, now a little bit of uh, gradients, but this won't be useful uh, for this um, workshop. Still, if you are curious, here it is. So torch vectors have this special property where they can track gradients. And then these gradients are what are used to train your large language models, deep learning models. Um, indeed, any, you might've heard of gradient descent, which is like one of the most uh, fundamental algorithms for training uh, anywhere from very small machine learning models to very complex, uh, large deep learning models. Gradient descent works on this principle that I have some kind of a loss. That could be some kind of an error. Uh, maybe I'm trying to estimate a face and I may, my model makes some error. And the idea of a gradient descent is I first come up with what that error means in math and I try to minimize that. And uh, the way that's done is I take uh, given a certain error function, I try to minimize it. And the way you minimize it is that you try and, if you're a little point on this uh, error function, you're trying to go to this lowest little point. Imagine yourself as a hiker and you're trying to get to the, the, the river down near the, the minima of where the error is. And so you want to go downward. And so that slope is called the gradient. And so what Torch helps you do if for every parameter in your model, you're, you're the hiker, you're the model, you're trying to get down there. For every parameter in the model, it associates, it can keep track of what the gradient is supposed to be. In which direction must my parameter move in order to make my loss go down? Okay, that is the, That's the principle of gradient descent. Uh, basically, there's some error that you're trying to minimize and every parameter in your model needs to be moved a little bit in some direction, uh, up or down, if it's a scalar, uh, in order to minimize this error. And so the direction you go in is known as the gradient. So um, the cool thing is that in Torch, these gradients are computed by default for you. And the way you do that is you, and this is not required for the workshop, so it might go over your head, but that's okay. We will go through it anyway. Um, so we initialize a tensor. Am I still recording? Yes, okay. We initialize a tensor uh, and we specify that we require gradients for this. And so when we print that, we can see that this tensor now has a single value for now. I'm keeping it very simple. This is not a, an array, it's a single value. And we say that this requires gradients. Now, what we do is we take this same W that we've just now initialized, and we multiply it with this torched array. Now, you might be asking yourself, torched is an array of one cross five or five dimension. W is a single scalar, but that's okay, right? You can multiply a scalar times a vector. You just multiply it element-wise. Okay. So there's no problem there. So we can do this operation, W times torched, and um, what we will do now is we'll come up with our own cost. We'll come up with our own error. Let us say that we are trying to reach the target vector, which is the second torch. So just to recap, second torch was six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. This is what these values were. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And torched is basically some W times uh, the, 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 the torched, which is one, two, three, four, five. And what, what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to find the right W so as to get this vector equal this vector. Say that was my simplest little machine learning problem and I wanted to find the right scalar 
so as to match the target vector where I had to go. Again, this might be a little more challenging, but that's okay. So what we do first, as I mentioned before, is we construct a loss function or an error function or a cost function. Basically, I am somewhere and I need to go down to the minimum. This is my loss, okay? So I come up with some kind of a math equation that tells me how far I am, how far I am given where I need to be. So I look at the difference and then I square it. Any, any idea what this kind of a cost function is called? It's a mean squared error, right? So we construct a loss function. And then what we can show is that, um, when you do some operations with the torch um, library, it can track the gradient of every parameter. So remember early on, we said that W is two. Whereas when we look at now the gradient of W, you actually get a certain value associated with it. What is the point of all of this? Again, I don't want to get I don't want to get into the details here, but I just want to let you know that such a thing exists. The point is that every parameter in a machine learning model can be associated to a certain gradient. And that gradient is given by this exclusive tensor that's that is saved alongside the different parameters of your model. And so modifying that parameter along the direction of gradient is what gradient descent does. So there are different other libraries that you can use, and those are called optimizers, that will take this gradient, take the value, and take a step in the gradients in, in the direction to improve this uh, value. The fact that torch vectors can contain these gradient uh, attributes directly next to the variable itself is what makes Torch suitable for these uh, iterative and stochastic methods, such as deep learning or machine learning models, where you don't, where you have to uh, go in the direction of some kind of a gradient and minimize the loss to get to the optimal solution. So, That's uh, a lot, huh? Yeah, this, this corresponds to the gradient, but. Yeah, of W, correct. No, but negative H is W here. It's the gradient of W. So we have we haven't yet updated W to reflect this gradient uh, direction. So I'm a hiker, I'm at some loss, and my value is two, right? So I'm I'm two, and with two, I'm getting a certain loss. My the, the detected gradient was minus eight. So if I take a step in that minus eight direction, that means that with my new value of W, I can perhaps get a lower loss. That's the way it works. So I highly recommend a deep learning course, but this is the cool part about Torch, where you can save these gradients along with the parameter itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So now we can we will be going back to some slides where we will talk about the typical machine learning process. Um, and then we will come back to implementing that in code. Okay. Okay, so are we still recording? We are recording. Okay, so why machine learning? Well, uh, we said LLMs are a type of generative model. And now we're going even further back and saying that generative models are a type of machine learning model. So it, I think it makes sense to at least quickly cover uh, what machine learning means, uh, at least in, 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 in broad sense, and then go back to some code, quickly recap some of that, and then finally, finally get into what LLMs do. Um, this is a three-day workshop, so we're pacing ourselves. So um, don't fret, we are nearly there, okay? Awesome. So these are some slides that we created earlier for a class, but fundamentally, well, what do we want to do? Well, we want a machine to be able to learn patterns that then can be used 
to in an automated way um, solve more patterns, right? So it's basically a method to uh, solve um, tasks where you have some data and you just want to extrapolate the task to new data. That's fundamentally how machine learning is posed. Um, and the only way you can really do that is by, in some form, whether it's implicit or explicit in the model, learn the rules underlying that data that you're trying to train with. And uh, in the case of, say, generative language models, such as Sora, you have no idea how it learned what it did, but it has some, right? In some cases, the models are more interpretable, right? So it varies. The deeper your model is, the more parameters it tends to have, the, the worse off it is for you uh, in trying to make sense of what's going on, okay? So in um, machine learning, there are multiple, oh man, you really cannot see that, but I'll make sure to not use that type that color in the future. But um, there are four roughly types of learning in machine learning. There's supervised learning, which you just have to take my word as the first uh, highlighted term there. Supervised learning is where you have labels for your data. So this might mean that, okay, I have a fruit and someone, some human annotator, some annotator came and told me this fruit is an apple. And now you say, okay, machine, here's a fruit. I'm calling it apple. Learn it. Learn the patterns. So that when I give you a new fruit, the machine goes, oh, I've seen similar fruits before. Um, this looks like an apple. Let me call it an apple. And so in the cases where you have labels for your data, uh, we call it a supervised learning task. Now, oftentimes it's hard to get labels for everything. And so you might rely on just finding groups of, uh, of similar patterns to begin with. And that is an example of unsupervised. So you don't have any supervision. You essentially just know that two objects are similar. You don't have a, a label associated. You don't have a class associated. You don't, you, you don't have, um, uh, you don't have a way to associate all the different um, objects that belong to the same class as that class. So it's just a group. So if I were in this room and I came in and said, okay, there are roughly two types of computers, the, the bigger desktop monitors at the back and the smaller laptops in the front, um, that's fine. But if I didn't know that those were called bigger monitors and these are smaller laptops, and all I knew is that these items are more similar then those items, that's an example of an unsupervised learning task where you don't have enough information to actually categorize these different objects into distinct and a priori defined classes. Rather, you just have a notion of similarity. So that's supervised and then you have unsupervised where you don't have any labels. It does not require human annotation for you to figure out that, um, uh, two objects are similar. I mean, you can just say, okay, if I give you a fruit that's yellow and another fruit that's yellow, chances are that they are both reflective of being a banana because you know they have the same features. But there is also a sufficient work being done where it's neither fully supervised nor fully unsupervised. Rather, there is some kind of sparse labeling going on. So you might have something like a semi-supervised learning uh, method or reinforcement learning also is a form where the labels are very rare and far in between. So can you think of a case where if you had to train a, a machine to do something, you have sparse labels? Here's an example. Let's take a game like chess. Um, you're making moves in chess and uh, you don't know if your move was actually good until you've really lost the game or you won the game. Yeah. So in such a case, the only supervision you have is towards the end of the game. The model is forced to make choices before the end of the game in order to maximize its success rate. We call that the return, okay? But 
in 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 a more general sense, in such cases where you need you need to make a sequence of decisions where you don't quite know the end result, where the end result is few and far in between, where the supervision is only whether you won a game or lost a game, in such cases, you might find these other approaches to be more useful. But for now, it's sufficient to just bear in mind that there's two types, supervised and unsupervised. Chess? Yeah, so you can think of chess, for example, where um, you as, an, as, a, as a model are tasked, given a game board, to make a, a, a move, right? So maybe you want to move your knight or your bishop or your queen somewhere. And um, at that point, at that instant, you don't have any kind of human annotator or any kind of annotation to tell you that, okay, this is a bad move. You only know it's a bad move after a sequence of moves when you find yourself down a queen or you've worse lost the game. So in such cases where you have to make a sequence of decisions to come to uh, a point where you can get human annotation, that's the point where you know the human annotations are sparse and they are only there for certain specific um, end states, right? So we have two types, right? Uh, supervised and unsupervised and within supervised, you can have roughly two types, classification and regression. There is a question on the quiz I can tell you right now to figure out whether LLMs are a classification task or a regression task. I will not be telling you that, but uh, something to keep in mind for the end. Um, so there are two types of tasks in supervised learning. There's classification tasks where given the labels, again, this is supervised learning of circles and triangles, you are asked to design a model that can separate the two uh, clusters. That's a simple classification task. You're asked to classify. That's say if I give you a new point somewhere here, you need to be able to tell me whether that is more likely to be a blue circle or a black triangle. Okay. Then on the other side, you have regression. Regression has to do more with trying to predict a, a target that is not, that is continuous, okay? So that could be things like a housing price, for example. That's what they always take as an example, right? So given, for example, the location, the size, the age of the house, maybe you want to predict what the housing price is. So in that sense, you want to regress with these features to try and predict what the final housing price would be. So what to you would be the difference between classification and regression? Yeah, that's that's it right there. So, but uh, to be, yeah, and any other uh, intuitions? Right, so categorical versus numerical, basically that you have categories here. You have discrete and, you know, uh, classes. If you're in one class, you're not the other class. And that's how classification is set up. In the case of regression, it's like you have a continuous non-categorical set of new numerical set of target values. For example, you can imagine the housing price to be along the y-axis here, and this to be, say, the age of the house, um, although that should go the other way. But um, you're essentially trying to predict uh, a numerical value. That's right. But the key point here is that the target variable is numerical. Uh, you're absolutely right, and we will be doing that in the in the code, coding part. So um, there was earlier a question about what a parameter is, and uh, this is a good example of what a simple parameter would be. So say you have a set of xi's, which are your input features, and you're trying to predict a set of target values, y axis. 
right? In the case of regression, you're trying to learn data, learn using data, using anything you have at your disposal, some data such that when I multiply these two, I end up getting the, uh, the value that I want. So say you know the age of the house and you're trying to predict its cost, then you can learn some multiplicative factor, for example, say data that might, you know, with, with some luck, give you the correct map between the input and the target variable output. Any questions? Okay, uh, don't worry, you'll be coding all of this in very, very soon. So that's totally fine. In the case of classification, again, you're trying to separate categories. So once again, you're trying to learn a parameter data such that, however, in this case, in the simplest case, when you multiply the two and you you know you figure out if this value is greater or less than a threshold, you're saying, okay, if I have a line, because basically this, this is the equation for a line, you're saying that if I have a point on one side of the line, it's one category. If I have a point on the other side of the line, it's another category. Okay. This is basically defining a hyperplane. So again, examples of parameters are those values in an equation that are being learned as a result of passing in a large amount of training data in order to satisfy some kind of a loss function. And these parameters change based on the data you input. And so for different data, you generate different models. When you say model, you're directly referring to, in fact, the parameters that govern it. Yeah. Um... I'm just wondering if we should get into this. This has to do more with training. So we will skip this for the time being. Um, okay, so large language model. But before we get there, uh, maybe we should discuss a few things. Let me see. Um, yeah, sure, why not? So we still have time, right? I do want to get to large language models. Yeah, we have more than enough time. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the challenges when dealing with classification and regression tasks. And one of the challenges is that if your data is very complex and your model is very bad, it's highly underparameterized, it doesn't have that many parameters, your model will underfit to the data, right? It will not be able to adequately capture the underlying patterns governing the data. Now let's go back and think of the large language models that we, we pointed out. Language has a high degree of complexity. And so it makes sense that in order to adequately model language, you need 175 billion parameters per class, right? But in simpler cases, maybe you don't. It's hard to judge when you don't have full transparency into how these points, you know, really behave in some kind of a space as to what kind of a complexity you need for your machine learning model. So before GPT-3, just two, three years before that, there were all kinds of models, like um, smaller T5 models, even smaller models such as um, there was BART, before that there was even glove vectors. None of them could adequately capture language as well as these much larger language models are able to do today. So it's very difficult to predict that in advance, but when your model, which is the black line here, which um, say in this case is just, it has a slope and it has an intercept, right? If you're trying to use that kind of a model to model this U-shaped set of data points, no matter how much you try, you're not going to do a good job, right? Because your model is underfitting to the data. So that is an example of um, underfitting. Now, conversely, you might uh, have an overfitting problem. So let's talk about overfitting. Um, in, the, in the space of LLMs, what would you say is an example of overfitting? If, for example, language was very simple, and uh, you threw 175 billion parameters at it. What do you expect to see in an overfitted model? 
it won't actually be generative, right? Uh, in an overfitting problem, these models tend to learn the data set rather than learning the task. So remember when we talked about how machine learning is supposed to come up with rules governing the data. Rather, what these overfit models do is that they're so, they're so powerful that they might as well just learn the data directly, not learn the rules. And so when you give a new data point, it's like, wait, hold on a minute. I know the data. You cheated me by not giving me enough data. So it's not my fault that uh, I'm stupid. It's your fault for not giving me enough complex data sets. So that is the converse problem. So either your model can be too weak or it can be too strong. And so in that case, what happens is your U is now modeled with these really high, um, high order uh, uh, models that require many, many parameters to perfectly characterize. And yes, your training quality will be phenomenal because that's what you're giving during training. But when you want to actually generalize it and use it for data that hasn't been seen before, these models usually suffer quite a bit. So where you want to be is somewhere exactly in the middle, right? Where you don't have too many or too few parameters and that the complexity of the model adequately captures the complexity of your data. Now you might ask me, how do you know? I mean, you're given some data set, you need to train a model. And we have methods to do that using things like cross-validation, using things like, um, so for example, what happens in cross-validation is we say, okay, here's the training data, but we won't train on all of it. We'll keep a, a small little bit out, right? And we'll train on this existing uh, data set, and we'll just keep testing on that little bit of training data, just to make sure that the model is neither too bad or too good, like too good in that this held out data set performs poorly. So within the training data itself, you tend to separate it into two parts, the training and a held out validation. So uh, that's a little bit about that. Of course, the same principles can be applied to classification as well. That was showing regression uh, in the case where you have two classes, same idea, the more complex your model, the more likely it is to underfit, oh, sorry, overfit. That's a highly overfit model. The problem here, of course, is that um, if I uh, take a point, uh, let me see exactly where that blue is in the middle here, uh, this overfit model would classify that as a blue point. Whereas if you look at what the general trend is, it should be a red. And in fact, this blue point was an anomaly in your training data, right? So again, whether you're doing regression classification or even other regression classification in deep learning, all of them have problems with overfitting, underfitting, and the way you select your parameters really matters. Now, if for example, you have your training data and you say, okay, you know what, you're right. I should keep a set out and test on that all the time. Now, what happens if you get too aggressive and say, you know what, I want to keep all my data for testing. Let me just train on a small little 5% of my training data. What might happen then? Yes, the variance is missing. You said underfit. Are you sure about that? I think it's more um, the randomization. You might not expect that. Yeah, but if you have fewer data points and the same complexity of model, the, the model is more likely to overfit. You don't have to model that many data points. Oh. Right? I guess it was underfit because I assume that if you only keep it subject like 5% for training, what if that 5% is not representation of the 100%? Yeah, that's definitely a problem, isn't it? Then so. Doesn't that mean underfit? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> What's happening is that your model has learned on a very small and limited data set. Yeah. And it hasn't really been exposed to 
the, the, the true variance oh, of your data. Whether or not it's underfit or overfit, the model will, will be bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so it's a nice green level, <clears throat> which is 95% for training. So if you don't, um, so typically the fraction is 80 20. So, uh, oh, yes. yeah. 80% training, 20% validation. They, they call that the validation set. Okay. Now, isn't that so strange to me? Because I've, I've been exploring this idea with Cambridge sets for years. It's so strange to me because it's like, isn't it like a computer? Isn't it so strange? Should be objective, right? So, no matter what you do, it should be the right answer, right? Um, I didn't quite get that. Like, like, you would think that computers are objective, unbiased. Uh -huh. So, therefore, they always give you the correct answer. No, no, uh, not in the case of most generative models where you're have where you're having to rely on a probability distribution to come to the conclusion to come to your inference yeah yeah quick question did i say to be say that that model have a lot more unrepresented or less data points you know, that a skipper is exposed to mm -hmm. rather than, so it means like less sample. So if you increase the sample, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have better results or uh, comparing to the parameters. So I think they're dual stuff one another. There's like trade off. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a trade off there. Okay. Yeah, so I think with that, it's a good time to go into the code now. So let's jump back into the code. So let's first um, walk ourselves through these different parts here. So uh, this part mounts a specific drive. Were you guys able to do this step? This one's the tricky one. Okay, great. <laughs> does the path work? And does all this work? Are you able to load the data basically? Yeah, you would have to do that. So you would probably have to change this path here based on where you have stored your iris.csv data file. So please do that. It works? Okay. I'll wait for everyone. I'm gonna pause the recording temporarily to make sure that everyone's on the same page here because this is important. Okay, so um, great. So let's um, uh, go with this. So now uh, we've discussed pandas, numpy, torch, well, let's get into pandas. I'm sorry, completely skipped that over you. 
But yeah, and I'll be going slowly through this until everyone else catches up, so not to worry. So import pandas as PD. Pandas helps you load and unload these kinds of CSV files. Very nice for data manipulation. If you work with R, pandas and R have a lot of uh, similar functions that you can use, but you might not like pandas uh, given R's extended functionality with uh, data. So the data frame in pandas is nowhere close to the data frame that you get in R. Just for putting that out there. But uh, nevertheless, um, in, uh, in Python with pandas, you can load the CSV file into what is called the data frame. That's, the, that's what the data structure is called. And now you can print the head, which basically refers to the top five lines of that CSV, just to get a sense of what's going on, okay? So you have the different column headers. So you have things like the sepal length width, the petal length width, and the variety. Clear? Great. Now, um, we'll skip that part. So let's move here. So um, what we're going to do now be doing is do a quick run through through this other library called sklearn. So pandas helps you in data manipulation. sklearn that you see here, scikit-learn, is basically a library that helps you with running small ML models, uh, machine learning models on this data to learn different properties and, uh, and maybe do some classification, some regression, um, so on. So what I'm going to do now is I will walk you through line by line a classification task using this sklearn library. And then after that, you need to fix all the bugs in an sklearn implementation that I've written. Okay, that's going to do the same thing. Okay, so if you scroll through simple classifier models, you'll see the first one, um, if you run that, let me run it with you. What's up? Yeah, you, you have to fix buggy code. So um, here is my correct implementation. And it, I'm, going, I'm telling you right now that this model, and I'll go through it line by line. Right, this model is giving you a 97% classification accuracy. Now, there is buggy code below this that if you were to run it, it would give you a very handy 35% accuracy. And so you have 96 bugs to kill. So we'll see how what, what we're doing, how we're doing things. And from there, maybe you can have a go at trying to fix all the bugs. So let me first introduce the right code, right? So what we're trying to do here is to predict the variety. So go, go back to the data frame to see how it looks. The variety column has a bunch of different labels for each row. Given these row values, am I recording? Yes, I'm recording. Uh, try to predict these classes, okay? And um, so you have four features the sepal length, width, petal length, and width, and you have the variety. I'm trying to predict the variety. If you use the variety as an input feature and predict variety as the output feature, that would kind of be dumb, right? We don't want to do that. That would be a very simple model where you just pass through the variety and get the answer. So what we do for the first line is we say df.drop variety. What this means is that I drop the variety column from my data frame so that my, my parameters, my features, my input in order to predict the target variables does not include the column variety, okay? That's what this means. I drop the feature variety from my set of features that I'm using for performing the classification. Now, why is the variety? That is what I'm trying to predict. So X contains all the columns that are not variety, Y contains only the variety column. And the goal is to predict Y given X. Make sense? I know this part is hard. That's why you're not asked to re-implement it from scratch. Rather, I'm, I'm giving you buggy code later to fix, okay? So 
So don't worry about it too much. I know this is a little bit. So um, the next step is, as I was talking about, splitting the data into a trained part and a test part. Right? So this train test split function takes your data, all of it, takes the X, takes the Y, and takes 20%. That's what this 0.2 means. 0.2 means 20% of the data has randomly been sampled and kept away as a test set. Okay, makes sense? And we set a random seed for this random sample. Now, um, at this point, we do something called scalar, standard scalar, which ignore it, there's no error here, but you it will work even without it. But the idea is that sometimes not all your features are scaled the same way. Right? Some of them might be talking about the age of a house. Other, other times you might have features that are talking about um, the size of a house. And so these are not usually at the same scale. And so this scalar, standard scalar part is meant for kind of trying to standardize across all the different um, uh, features. Okay. So what we do is we scale all the input features, X train scaled, by calling this function fit transform on the train subset of X. Clear? Is that clear? And then we don't retrain it. Re see, we, we don't fit it again on the test. Okay. We train it on the train and then we directly transform the test uh, data. Okay. We never train on, on, on test. Don't ever train on test, okay? What did you transform? Yeah, so the point is for you to learn the bounds of that transform from the train data, and then use the same bounds on the test data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you sometimes all your um, okay. Um, if you're looking at the age of a person, um, this goes between one and a hundred, zero and a hundred. And so, but if you have another um, feature that's somewhere between minus five and five, now in order to compare these, you ideally want both the means to roughly align. Mean means the average of all the points. So if if you have all of these points between one and 100 and the average is like 35, whereas you have another set of features where the average is like minus one, these are two like very dis distant distributions followed, right? So you have different Correct, the, the different features you call them. What's the con? The con of doing that? You usually have to pre-process your, your data in some way like this, um, but there is no direct answer for you. Like you should always use this kind of pre-processing. Depending on your data, depending on your data analysis, you might decide to do any anything else, right? So there's so, no one answer for you. So this is just like a normal modification. Yeah, this is just a template classification pipeline. So this scalar thing, that's just like pre processing. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What if it's not a number? There's a, you should look at the regression code later, but yeah. Okay. So now we define S, uh, the support vector classifier. SVC, is, this is basically a classifier. You can imagine this as a hyperplane. Okay. So this is a hyperplane that you're trying to learn on this data. And uh, we have initialized it. So basically, we have constructed this model now. That's what this is doing. By saying it's linear, it basically means that it is a hyperplane, right? It's not something else. And SVC basically is referring to a hyperplane. The difference is that your there are details here, but I'm going to skip over it. For now, all you need to know is that this SVC corresponds to a hyperplane that you're trying to learn. Correct. So you have four features, and each of these features corresponds to a dimension. Okay. So your each point, each row, 
in your data set is is contributing a point in a in a 4D vector space where each axis is a feature. And your job is to come up with a hyperplane on this space that adequately um, distinguishes the different classes. Okay. So what we do now is we fit the model on the training data. This is literally how simple it is. This is all machine learning people do. They just call these libraries and uh, they say fit and you're given the training uh, features and the testing fee and you know the target variables by print. And now you have a trained model. That's how simple it is, okay? And then you say, okay, now I'm going to predict on the test data. Is that, is that clear up to here? Any questions? And then lastly, you compute an accuracy score. How similar is the test, is, is the ground truth test label to the predicted uh, test label? Yeah, you have an irrelevant question. Okay. Okay, random step. Why it's pretty good and what does that mean? Forty-two. Is Forty-two is the answer of the universe, but no, uh, people just like to set it so that when you want to run your code over and over, there's not much difference in the results. When you set the random state to forty-two, it picks the same rows over and over. I I have a question. Yeah. Okay, I can. Yeah, accurate. Yeah, so you are comparing the true labels of your test set that you held out at the beginning. Remember, we did a train test split here. So it isn't like your true labels are Y. That's right. But recall that this Y corresponds to both the train and the test set. We split that into a training part and a testing part in this line. So we, you to correct, correct. Which is what we are doing down here. You can say why that the entire thing. Exactly. Exactly. So why test is the ground truth labels or the test set. Yeah. yeah. And why pred is the predicted labels on the test set. And your job now is to compute the accuracy. So we did that, we got 97%, everything's good. So now we have 15 minutes, maybe 20, but there's buggy code at the end, okay? Like right, right here, right below this. And given all that we have discussed so far, um, your goal now is to try and, have I coded that right? I think so. Oh, this should be 0.73. My apologies. You'll never get to 97. So, okay. Uh, yeah, that makes more sense to me. So uh, let's try and find all the bugs in... Uh, oh, if you, if, you don't, if you guys don't mind changing this from 97 on the bottom line to 90s, 0.97, it's purely for fun, but uh, yeah. And to make it more accurate. Also remove the integer and just, yeah. If you can just copy this line at the bottom, that would be nice. But basically try to fix all the bugs that you find and try to get to the desired performance. Okay, so this is the last thing we'll be doing today. Yeah, question. I'll, I'll just wrap up here and then I'll get to you. So um, tomorrow we will start with LLMs. Today we'll just work around, we'll work our way through this. And tomorrow we'll start with LLMs. That's the first thing we do. Does that work? Okay, I think we're all primed and ready to go for the first thing tomorrow to start doing LLMs. Okay, let me now pause this recording and then get to you, right? Recording? Yeah, so uh, we'll just cover the regression task really quickly here. So once again, now we use the same data set and we are trying to um, predict the petal width. So that's going to be our target variable. Remember, we cannot use the same variety target variable because this is not a classification task anymore. We are trying to predict a numerical or a 
continuous target variable. And one such feature that we wanted to use was the petal width. Okay. So now all of our target features will be the petal width. And we want to use the other features to predict the petal width, okay, including the variety. So um, we drop the petal width from the data frame and we store the petal width as the feature to be predicted. So once again, same story, X contains all the features we can use, Y contains the features we want to predict. Okay. I don't get it. Did you get oh, never mind. Okay. So uh, once again, we do the train test split. So there's no change here. We take 20% as test. And uh, he, here's a trick, but I'll get to that later. There's no errors here, so don't worry about it. But this addresses your question directly on how to encode categorical features uh, in purple regression task. But uh, OK, so um, we'll skip all that. Uh, OK, so we, we OK, once again. We define a model, right? And then we fit the model. Yeah. That's all it is. And then we predict from the model. That's it. Okay. And finally, we compute the error. They shouldn't. So yeah. you, you compute the error. In regression, we typically like to use the mean squared error that I showed you earlier. And so you compute the exact distance between the predicted house price and the actual house price, or in this case, the predicted petal width and the true petal width. So that would be the test versus the predicted. And you compute the mean squared error and you report it. Um, really quickly, going back to your point uh, about the classes and how we encode categorical variables for regression. Uh, the way we typically do it is we take, say we have four classes, we do this thing called a one-hot encoding, where if I have a banana, an apple, an orange, and a peach, then I say, okay, I'm going to create a four-dimensional vector where each index represents a fruit. So if I get a banana, then I'll say one, zero, zero, zero. If I get a peach, I'll do zero, one, zero, zero. So that's basically a one-hot vector. And so there are functions in Python and in sklearn that help you directly convert these categorical variables into, yeah. Wait, yeah. So these combinations would be n minus one, right? the category is kind of because uh, the fourth combination would be, would be, you know, zero, 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 and then the fourth would already be one. Right? That's a very cool observation. Absolutely, so you can cut one dimension from it, but let's not go there. No. So, yeah, let's stick with, one for each. So I was asking that if we have that fourth dimension, yeah. you know, by the state, would that create a problem? It doesn't. So it just increases the competence. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the one hot representation just says that every dimension, we take a bunch of categories and we assign a dimension in a vector to that category. Right? Um, yeah, so the order has to be uh, predefined. That's the that's the reason we do a fit here. So the fit part of this column transformer is basically assigning every category in your variety column to one index in your one hot encoded feature. That's a little uh, off topic here, but we can get into that later. Yeah, uh, maybe after the class. But uh, in your okay, so yeah, we've reached the end of the session. So in your time, maybe today, tomorrow, whenever. Uh, feel free to fix this next bit of buggy code. It's the same thing copied over, but once again, if you run it, you'll find out that in fact, there are tons of bugs. Oh, my bad. Let me just run the cell, run the cell. And uh, if we run this, we will see that in fact, we do very bad. Yeah, so the SOTA is 0 0.09 and the buggy code has a, value of 1.1. So how do we get to SOTA, uh, state of the art, and uh, try to get this oh, one part to zero? Yeah. The mean squared, the range, can be anywhere below one to... Zero to infinity. Yeah. I tried to make it go higher, the buggy code, but I just wasn't able to. Now, how can we... I mean, how is it? 
I just, you know, actually, you can pass in this code to chat GPT and ask it to introduce bugs that test concepts. Oh, is that what you did? No, I didn't, but you can <laughs> potentially do it. So I did it myself, yes. Okay, so I think we're out of time today and we'll start back up tomorrow. As you can see, there's no more of this kind of coding. The next part is our lens, okay? So I think we're well set to start tomorrow. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.